From facing setbacks to thriving comebacks, some assembly required is all about the head and the heart and that mushy space between them. Some might say that the lucky few among us find a passion early in their lives. But what we often forget when making a statement like this is that a passion and a purpose also come with struggles. We see a pristine architectural masterpiece and forget how the structure tormented the talented artist. Or we watch a gymnast flick flack her way across the Olympic mats and forget the immense pressure that she feels. Or we bear witness to a South African dancer taking center stage in front of a live British television audience wearing black high-heeled patent leather boots, strutting, shimmying, and high-kicking to Blondie's rapture and forget the adversity that he faced to get there. Now, that South African dancer, Jojo, is finally home. Johannes Radebe, thank you for sitting down with me. I am flawed. Sean, thank you for the introduction. Never in my life have I had my life explained in how many seconds was that? <laughs> We're not that is, timing. That's beautiful. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Only a pleasure. I am so honored to have an opportunity to sit down with you. And I, there's so many questions that I need to have answers to. Thankfully, your book details so much of your life. But before that high-heeled, patent-leathered boot dance on the UK Strictly Come Dancing, how long had you been part of the show's cast? And how did that piece of choreography come about? Okay. Okay, we all we are all aware that I've done this in South Africa for three years. It's two seasons of of Strictly Come Dancing, and then it went off to be Dancing with the Stars. And then I was invited here for a year where I did not have a partner. And it was the second year that I was in the UK that this opportunity came about. And when I say opportunity, they we normally do group dances every single year, but this particular dance when the concept was, was well, when we'd been told about what we were going to do for the, for the entire series, I remember just talking to my choreographer, the choreographer at the time, and she said, this is what we want to do. This is where we're going. This is what we want to represent. And I was just like, oh, Jesus. Now all, everybody's going to know about my life. And I think, you know, it took a couple of days for me to, because they were like, you don't have to wear these heels. But we're just saying, if you wanted to, here's an opportunity. I was like, oh my goodness. I mean, I won't have, I won't have to be doing it in my bedroom anymore. Now I'm going to do it you know, in front of the world. And I knew what that moment meant for me because it was my coming out moment. You know, for to my extended family, you can imagine all the uncles and the aunts in faraway areas that are still asking about my wife and kids. I knew that they were sitting at home watching this and thinking, what the hell? But it was, it, it, it took a lot, it, it took a lot of, 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 of just processing it all and just coming to terms with the fact that, okay, fine, this is it, you know, and it was gorgeous and it was glorious when it happened. And you really have stepped into that moment. I mean, we met because your dance partner on the South African version of Strictly Come Dancing was part of my radio show team way back then, Leanne Williams. And you have oh. glowing things to say about her. And she has only the best words to use from her vocabulary every time she speaks about you. Uh, you tell so many great stories in your memoir, Jojo, Finally Home. Mm -hmm. I, I need to know the process of writing the book. What was that like for you? I, I can't imagine someone being a prolific note keeper but i also can't imagine someone having a memory like a fortress <laughs> your stories are so detailed oh you know what this is the, that's the beautiful thing about it sean because um in writing it i was back home at the time um and i had an opportunity to sit down with my family and recall and reminisce about the past you know, because as you can imagine, I might, I might have lost out on, on a few things that has happened, but also an opportunity for us to address what we've been through in life and take account of that. And that was, that was, that's where the details came in, you know, because like I say in the book, you know, for the first time I sat down with my mom and I spoke about, you know, her, her marriage to my father and why she stuck around in that abusive relationship for such a long time. It was interesting to hear where she was coming out, she was coming from with it. And, I, and I, it, it had to take this long for us to come to terms with that. Do you know what I mean? Because we are always growing. So 
I've got my family to thank because they've been on this journey with me. Um, they really, really have from day one of writing it. Um, and, and, and yeah, I say it, it's really also left us in a better place as, as, as a family um, for doing it. Try and take me back to the early years. What was it like for you to grow up in the township, in Zamdela? The sights, the sounds, the feelings. What is that emotion? What, what stirs up in you when you think back of the early years living there? Home was, was always home, filled with love, um, joy, compassion. Mm. You know, um, always felt safe. That was a thing. But the truth of the matter is it was boring and I was, it was stifling. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? For the fact that I did not have a childhood like any other child, like I couldn't pay, play in the streets without being, without being antagonized, so to speak. So the only places that I felt safe was at dance practice and at home because school also turned out to be a nightmare. You know, it was just like, can I ever exist, you know, in a world that accepts the fact that I'm a bit happy and a bit flamboyant, you know, but it was never, it was never an opportunity for me. So I have to say my early teenage years, I really, it felt, I felt isolated, you know, um, it was hard to make friends. It was really difficult to make friends. So the ones that I had, I clung on to, and I'm sure they were sick of me, but you know. That, that's what we did. And of course, when I found dance, it was, it was an excuse. It was an excuse for me to, to, to escape. And I always call dance my refuge because it really, really was. Whether, whether the kids that day were there or not, I, know, I knew somebody would have been there. So that's where I would run to and spend all my days at. Um, and it was, it, 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 I did that for a long time. You know, and I think that is why I'm still doing it today. Thank God for that. Because I think I would have dropped out, Sean. And, you know, it, because there were points, there were moments in my life where it's just like, what, what am I even trying to achieve here? Because even at home, my, you know, the whole thing of me dancing, they were like, oh, it's just a hobby. It's a phase. And it used really to crush me because I was like, this is what I'm passionate about. You guys want to be doctors and nurses and whatnot. I want to be a dancer. But of course, there was no understanding to that. Do you know? They were like, excuse me, what? Uh, what, do you, what did you say? And <laughs> I was just like, am I ever going to find a world where all this could be possible? Do you know what I mean? And I'm so happy that I had to stack it up because like I said, it never, it never, it wasn't fun. It wasn't, I don't, I don't, I look back at it now and I'm like, yes, I'm thankful for my family and friends at the time. But it was just, it was horrid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's something about the way you've named the book Finally Home that has so many truths to it. It's not just being in a particular place, but it's accepting so many other things of your entire journey. Uh, I must admit to you that we share a love for dance and for movement, but we have very different people that inspired us to step onto the dance floor. For me, I was eight or nine. 1987, the year yes. you were born. 87. Yeah, well, born. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and Patrick Swayze starred in Dirty Dancing. And <laughs> after seeing that movie, I danced on any surface that would hold me. I, I took up modern dance. I had my yes. pointed shoes. The, the guys at school didn't like it very much, but I thoroughly enjoyed moving yeah. in front of the mirror and, and just controlling my body. It, it, I have a natural flexibility. Uh, I, didn't stick, I didn't stick with the dance and I, I wish I had, especially watching how you have transcended all of those levels. Uh, and it's one thing that I, that I kind of regret having given up. Your story to the dance floor is very different though. Won't you share what inspired you to get up and, and dance? Truthfully, it was it was never about the dancing. Sean, you understand this as well, coming from 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 a township in South Africa. Everybody can move. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. You play music, everybody goes into some dance. So it, for me, it was never about that because also it was that when I said I'm doing cha 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 and I'm doing jive and paso doble, people were like, "Wow, whatever." You know, it was like, I'm like, it's a skill. You, you can't, not everybody can do it. And nobody ever wants to understand it. For me, though, I have to say it was the drag. It was a yeah. problem, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first was introduced to Borum in Latin, I, these people demonstrated what the art form was to us. And they really went to town into putting on the outfit and putting on the makeup and then coming out and presenting this beautiful art form. And I remember just sitting there and going, oh, my goodness, I want to wear that 
sequined tail coat. <laughs> I, that's all. I, I didn't care about anything else. And it was then my coach, my late coach, Ben Musia, who said to me, if you really want to wear the clothes, then you should stick around. And it, it was through sticking around that I fell in love with it. I, mean, I fell in love with dance in a way that was unimaginable because I was just like, how could, how could the world not know about this? You know, we should all be doing this. You know, all of a sudden I was just like, it, it just makes, and like you're saying, it made me, like when they, were, when they were bullying and they were teasing, I was like, I don't care what you have to say. You know, this is one thing in my life that really brings me joy and happiness and a sense of security and worthiness. And that's why I stuck to it. But firstly, it was never the dancing, to be honest. It no, was really- yeah. <laughs> but that, that I've got to say, that's internal strength for me because I couldn't put up with the bullying. I didn't enjoy that. I cowered yeah. under a lot of that. And I know you're saying that, you know, it hurts and it does definitely hurt. Um, but you continued to pursue your dance, which many of the others, myself included, don't. That shows incredible personal strength joe that's that's not just something that everybody has you're quite right those growing in the township most can move and move exceptionally well for you to choose an art form like ballroom like latin dancing like the cha-cha and the jive and the pasa doble and learning those skills there's tenacity and there's there's personal strength there that's not just something that you that you do, you know, you don't just put up with bullying for the sake of it. So I know, but isn't it funny that it's only now that I've, that I'm only patting my back mm. and saying well done to myself for having to, keep to, to put up with it. You know, somebody said to me, Joe, um, how did you do it? I said, well, purely because I didn't have a plan B, you know, there was no, there, there was no other way around it. And it's just, if it, and, and I, I accepted all of that and I dealt with all of that because I knew in my heart of hearts, I knew this was right. Where it was going to end up, I didn't know. You know, I remember my father, before he passed on, he was like, I mean, come on now. You're at an age where you need to really make a decision about where you what you want to do with your life. And I was like, really? <laughs> and... He passed on and thank God my mom left me to my own devices and didn't control that because I also think that is the biggest thing when you have people around you that nurtures and supports you. I, I, I'm grateful for that because, like I said, I would have probably walked away from it as well a long time ago and there was a lot of that, but it made me happy. Mm. Nothing else. Nothing else made that did in that time. So mm. that was the only thing, and I was not going to compromise that for anybody else. Do you remember who the first person was that called you Jojo? <gasps> no, you know that. No, no, you know because I think I got it in different parts of the world. So just okay. because I I left South Africa and I went I, and I, I was on a cruise ship for seven years, and then I found myself you know, doing things in between and here. So through that stage, people has, 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 has come up with that and say, oh, Jojo, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. But it's really just, it, it, I, it's really just stuck with me now recently when I've just been around where people have just been like, Jojo, I'm like, really? Is that what everybody's going with nowadays? It seems, it seems like it. It seems like it. I, I think it's your, your affable nature. You're so warm and inviting and genuine and kind. And, and it, it's like, it feels very comfortable to call you Jojo. And it does, I don't have to think twice about it. You know, like it, it, just, it just happens. Um, jo, if, if we have to recall some of the things that you've documented in the book, would yeah. you mind telling me about the time that you auditioned to be part of the cast on a cruise liner, a, a dance troupe, only? to have to have emergency surgery and then nearly miss your flight. Sean, isn't that a story? <laughs> isn't that a story? I mean, to to be even be you know when you it's it's and this is why the they, this is why this book is important because I want to tell everybody that you are worthy. You are worthy of all that you desire. Because as much as this opportunity came along and somebody said, I feel like you could you could do this. I was like, I had doubt. I was like, I'm not, I'm not formally trained. You know, I, 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 do, I don't have the best training. That's what I used to say to myself. Why, why would you even think of dreaming? 
And it was through a friend of mine who said to me, you go into that audition. You're going to go audition for the cruise ships and I'm going to make sure that you do it. And believe you me, the day that of the audition, I went out the night before. I was in, in, I was at Simply Blue in Bramfontein partying like there's no tomorrow. And because I made up my mind that I'm not going to the audition the following day because I was just like, they're never going to use, they're never going to take you. Like, why would you even think that? Why do you think? And then I walked in to the audition after a friend of mine dropped me off and said, this is what you're doing today. Hung over. And the first section that the choreographer taught us was Latin American dancing. And it took me two seconds to scan the room and realize that I was the only Latin dancer in that room. And, you know, that came, that brought a sense of confidence um, because I was just like, oh, they're asking me to do something that I normally do every single day. And I, I went to town and at the end of that audition, I had a job and just how quickly things had moved, you know, but it was also the whole thing that when they said to me, where's your passport? And I was like, "I, I don't have a passport. And they're like, well, why, why not? And I was like, I've never ever thought of leaving these shows. Like, why would I want to leave home? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it was that when I saw their reaction in their face. Though, and, you know, this this man at the time sitting me down and saying, you know, you are very talented. And I don't think you know that. I don't think you realize that. So we are here to to, to make you realize your potential obviously, but listen, go home, do the passport and come back. Even that's why the whole dilemma at the airport, you know, not have never, not, not, I've never traveled. I've never been on a flight. That would have been my first time flying to Italy. And that is why I almost, I, I'm, I'm, I was off booked and the flight was on its way when he turned around to come pick me. Like that is crazy thinking about it now, because in my however years of traveling, I've never seen it happen to anybody. So when you see, were aligned i can't tell you because when i ran down the stairs after going through security airport to go to my flight and i went to the first class lounge with my economy ticket and i was told that my flight is <laughs> my flight was leaving and there i was running down the escalators i was just like my life is over but in that as well i remember crying to this to the, to the lady and said please please help me this is my only chance to get out of my situation, you know what I'm saying, to escape that, that I was talking, you know, that, that stifling feeling I had for all those years in my township. And that's just knowing that, and I think it was also now, now learning, it's like, like it was ne- my mental health. I was really, I'm a really happy child, but I was not a happy young boy, you know, and that really bothered me as well because I was fully aware of it even though I didn't know what to do with it. So I said to this lady, please get me out of here. And I remember her calling the captain and saying, please, please, please. And there I was on a flight to Italy. And believe me, Sean, I never, ever looked back. But I just, you know when you just feel like there's a divine, there's a divine power? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's incredible for me reading through the pages of the book, how that was a defining moment. And then you surpassed that. And then you didn't think it was going to get any better. And then you surpassed that level. And it didn't, it wasn't going to get any better than that, Joe. And then you've surpassed that level. Can I ask you, if you had the opportunity then to sit with 10 year old Johannes, yeah, you've probably thought about this. What would you say yeah. to him? I would say to him, you are worthy. You've always been worthy. Your family absolutely adores you. So never for a second doubt that. And with that, I would say to him, always be yourself and the world will adjust. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's times when I tried to, you know, change and alter that somehow. But mm-hmm. growing up, you understand that more now. Yeah, in reflection, we surely do. You were born in 1987, you spring chicken, you. (laughs) Fast forward to the year 2013-ish. What were some of the things that you had recently endured and were being confronted around that time? In terms of what endured in... in, 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 Around the year 2000, around when you're 13, that's sort of coming of age. You've gone from being 10, now you're moving into adolescence. Some of the things that you were experiencing during that time. I think think the biggest thing for me at the time was 
was leaving my township and going to Johannesburg, Ennerdale, um, leaving everything that I was comfortable and that I, you know, I was comfortable with with where I was and 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 I just that 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 was that has always been my world. I don't even know where to go with this, but it was leaving home at that at the tender age and convincing mom and dad because dad passed away a couple of weeks after I left my township. You know, it was having to confront the um, the, the the issue of I'm going to Johannesburg to go pursue my dancing career while I finish my schooling. That both my parents had to come to terms with. You know, mom didn't want me to go because she just she she, she she didn't want she didn't want somebody else to be looking after me while it is her job as a mother to look after her kids, as if she was never going to allow me to leave that house. But she she really found that difficult, you know. And I remember thinking to myself, "Oh, Johannes, you are selfish. How can you leave your mom?" You know. But and and then and then it was my father who thought, like I said to you, was a phase and was going to pass. But when that moment of me having to leave the township came, you could see the re- that, that, that the resistance. You know, it was like, well, "What do you think you're doing?" And that that really hurt at the time as well. Um, but I had a I, I had a I had a goal, as so to speak. I, you know, I really just wanted to dance and be good at it. But I moved to another township, you know, and this time around it was a colored township, not a black township. And you yeah. can imagine that came with its challenges as well. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I don't want to tell lies. With colored communities, I don't know what happens there. There's just, you know, there's just, there was a confrontation that you could not deny, you know. And and, and people are much more vocal. Like I said, at school for me, it was like, why, are they, why do these kids have an opinion? Because where I come from, you there, there would have been a shambok. You don't speak back to the teachers. Like where, yeah. in the new setting, it was just like, it was just a bit too much, but it was also having to come to terms with that. And I was very young. I was 13, 14, you know, some say, being away from my family, mm. being away from the love and support and security of my family. Yeah. And there's a lot that happens in those formative years. A lot of our, our core beliefs start being formed around those times about who we are, about where we fit into the world, about what we're capable of. Um, and you're being removed from that support structure as you've known it for so long. Yeah. And then almost adopting a brand new family, living in a home that was constantly being filled with people, an entirely different school, an entirely different community, social structures, and um, trying to maintain a dancing career, trying to build on the skills that you have, always having this vision of it, hopefully, being able to take you somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. No, no guarantee. No, and there's no guarantee in life. So let's put that caveat there as well. But you've turned things you've turned things around very well for yourself. I mean, your writing, I must say again, is so easy to read. I really felt like I could hear your voice while I was reading. And at times, I almost imagined myself sitting in a chair opposite you as you were uh-huh. reading out loud. It really felt like you were in the same room with me. Yeah. And, and, and at times, I got angry with you. And there were definitely times where I, I had to choke back my own tears because it, it really is it's moving in so many parts. And I, I can't help but wonder how many times you've replayed moments then leading up to You've now mentioned, you know, leaving home and yeah. your father passed away a few weeks yeah. thereafter. What would he have to say about, you know, the things that you've achieved since his passing? Do, do you ever think about stuff like that? I do. I do, Sean. And it, it, it brings me to tears. It really brings me to tears because I do wish that he was here to. And you know what? Because you, you, you will never know, right? You will never know what 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 he would say or how he would take all of this happening and everything. Um, and I think that is that is a sad thing about life. Um, but I rest in the fact that on his deathbed, you know, he could not even talk, the poor man. But I do. He he was my father. And it was it was through him showing affection to me that I realized because I, like I said in the book, you know, I had to wait for my father to be to be drunk for me to have access to him. Well, that day he was very sober, um, and there was affection, you know, um, 
Oh God, I'm feeling emotional. It's been a lot today, Sean. I'm sorry. Mm. No. <laughs> okay. Mm. So that, so that, I've lost my train of thought now. That's that's perfectly fine. We're asking you to reflect on very hard things. So and that, that, and that it, it, it is. Listen, it is. It is. It it was hard, and it's still hard. And I think today, more 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 than ever, like I said to my agent, you know, I'm an author today. You know, um, that is huge. Do I wish that my father was here? Yes, I do. I wish my mother flown in. I wish my sister was here. I wish my aunt Martha was here. Um, and unfortunately, I'm in the United Kingdom now, you know, by myself. I'm surrounded by love and friends. Yes, I am. But, you know, this is my family that I'm talking about. And I've gone on to do great things in life. And they've never been able to be in the same space or time as me when all of this is happening. So it, it has really been, it has really been hard, honestly. And mm -hmm. every time I had to revisit these stories with my cousin having to have done what he's done a couple of weeks ago, it has really also just opened up wounds, you know, um, because for the first time I said to my family, because I've been preaching this to them, I said, you all need therapy. And they laugh at me because, you know, as black people, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I'm, I'm, I, said, I, said, I said, you guys need to go to therapy. So to hear my cousin who's lost his brother, mm. to hear him say, I wish my brother was still alive and we went to therapy when my mom passed away. I don't think we would have been where we are. So yeah. thank you for insisting on that and thank you for even for paying for it. Because I think it's not even sometimes the fact that we can't, we don't want to do it. It's just that why would you want to pay for therapy when you mm -hmm. don't have food in your stomach? So I'm blessed to be in a position now to be able to see that through for them. Yep. Mentally, whatever they need. I'm very, very, very grateful. Very happy. And I know they are too. I know they are too. You make mention, Johannes, of so many dynamic characters in your book. Uh, you quote um, Osim Po as saying, don't step off that podium, Johannes. Yeah. That is where you belong. Yeah. In the book, I got the impression that those words washed over you at the time. Yes, they did. So when did you start believing her statement? You know, it was it, it, it happened later, later on, later on when I started realizing the injustice and the politics within the dancing world, you know, mm. um, when when you were told by your adjudicators and everybody that was legendary and iconic at the time in the dancing world that you are never going to amount to anything because of because of, you know, I mean, when you look at it back now, you're just like, yeah, because I'm black and poor. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, how do you even, how, how do you explain that? How do you tell kids that they're never going to win because they don't have, they're not, they're not well-groomed, you know? I mean, you should know my situation and understand where I come from and see beyond that. Let's look at the talent. It's not what I'm wearing. But I, when I started real, when growing and learning, and the, that was hard for me. That really, really was hard. And it took, it took, it took Osimpo to say it a couple more times, not only once, but a couple more times for me to sit with it and like, okay, fine. You know, this does not define me. And this was not, this does not define me as a dancer as well, because I, I, I am passionate about what I do and I love what I do and I'm great at what I do. And yes, I, you, are. I, you know, you know what I mean? I, I needed, I, I, I needed to get to a place where I understood that for myself. And I did. And I always kept quiet about it. You know, I was like, you don't have to tell the rest of the world that now you can keep it to yourself, you know, sure. to, to say that you're great. Nobody has yeah. to know. You can know that for yourself. And I think that's also, that was also the power in all of it, you know, to say it's, it, I'm worthy. It comes down to that. Right. It really is. And yeah. And and I've never, I've never stepped down because I knew that I could have been on that podium if it wasn't because of all these other factors. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I could have been, but it was because of, yeah, just prejudice. And I feel sorry for them, you know? And I look back now and I'm like, thank God I stuck it out. Because if I had, yeah. to, if I had to listen to them, Sean, can you imagine? 
No, I don't want to imagine. Thank you very no. much. I'd, I'd rather not. Uh, the the themes that come out for the from the book for me, Johannes, themes very much along the lines of acceptance, accepting where you are, where where one is at any given stage of their life, accepting who you are, accepting what you are worth, and accepting what it is that you value most, and then being able to to channel into that. Um, it does make me want to ask, how do you cope with pressures? Are, are the pressures internal pressures to achieve and succeed at things? Or are, do you not feel pressure at in any way, shape or form to, because you're now a bit of an icon, my friend. You say that. I think, I think you've stepped into that realm. Um, so I don't want to, I don't mean to put pressure on you. Yeah. But is there a, a way that you cope with making sure that the pressure stays at bay? You know, you can't come from where I come from <laughs> and and all of a sudden, I don't know how to put it, but where I come from humbles me. It really, really does. And I'm grateful for my family as well because they 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 really know how to bring me down to earth. You know, <laughs> so I don't think without, I think without them, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the man that I am today. That's, that's the, that's the truth. That's the reality, you know, and that is why it's important for me to always come home and, and just touch base because mm. it really sets me up for whatever it is that I need to do. Because when you're reminded that you don't need to go out into the world and seek validation, you know, that when you're constantly reminded of that, you do stand in a certain power. You know what I'm saying? And and, and that's it. And, that, and that's it, my darling. I don't allow, I, I can't, because also I realize that the pressure always comes from the outside, never from the inside out. You know what I'm saying? So if, 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 if you don't allow yourself to do that, to take all that, uh, I mean, you can, but it happens. You know, it will come to you whether you want it or not. But I think it's important for you to sit back and then and, and, and then and then take what you want to take and discard what it is that doesn't work for you. You know, it's it's a beautiful sentiment to say that it comes from the inside and those external things. You're not seeking that validation and that's not driving you. It's yeah. whatever's inside that you that you feel you, you want to achieve or a- accomplish or strive to to do. Um, I'm going to ask you to play a little bit of a game with me here. I'm looking for one word, one word to try and sum up each of these years in your life. And I'll start with the year 2007. Is there a word that sums up the year 2007 for you? Um, learning. 2012. Growth. 2015. Happiness. 2018. Content. It's going to say 2020, but we kind of, well, let's go with it anyway. 2020. <laughs> Transformative. And 2023? Finally home. Mm. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Johannes, last two things. What has the world not yet seen of Jojo? Oh, no, Trent, that's a tough one. Do I, do I even know? Probably not, no. More freedom, more unleashed freedom, um, oh. exceptionally unleashed freedom, freedom <laughs> unleashed to the power of five. Who knows, right? The power of 100. Listen, honestly, that I mean, there's just great things that are happening in my life and that I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not denying that at all. This today being one of the highlights of my career is, Honestly, I didn't think that would be, well, I say career as if, you know, it's a thing, it's, it's, a, it, it's a thing, it's a thing for a township boy to be an author and to really just work my soul. So I have to say there's moments in my life that come um, and I'm just like, whoa, I, I, I've never, ever thought that this would be possible. And now here it is, you know, so we're going to see what's going to happen as time goes by. You know, and I love it. You know, I'm still afforded, you know, by his grace to still be on this planet. But I say, I'll do my best. That's what we can do, right? 
Mm -hmm. Um, why don't you hold that book in front of you again and remind me who is the book for? Okay. Okay. I wrote, you will see here most the most most important lesson for me is that to my mama. You know what I'm saying? And I said today in an interview earlier on, I said it's 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 for her it's for her love, it's for what she imparted on, on, on us as a family. It's the it's the sacrifice and the compromise. And when you when you understand what that woman has been through in life, you just kinda of like you start believing in human angels. If you know what I mean. Um and yeah, I mean, and I hope everybody also is inspired by it all and reading it. But honestly, it, this is to my mama. And there, there's no other way to say thank you to her, honestly. I don't know. I don't know what, because I tried throughout the years. And I don't even know whether this is still enough. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I'm glad that, you know, <laughs> people will also now learn that it hasn't always been me, you know. It's, it's, it's my mom. Like, she, she's the person that has... That has really fueled the dream. So I owe it to her. Beautiful. From the earthy streets of Zamdela to the glittering lights of London and everything in between. Congratulations, Johannes. Thank you. Buddy. Congratulations. Thank you for your time, Sean. Thank you. This is absolutely beautiful. Thank you.